All right, I think I'm live. Hello, everybody. My name is Maria. Um, I'm a fifth year medical student, and I'm here today to teach you guys the um, the diencephalon and the cerebellum. Just bear with me because this is my first time doing this online, so um, not very tech friendly. So <laughs> if something goes wrong, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, okay, so. This is my uh, overview of the lecture, and um, you can see that I divided the, the lecture into, mostly I'll be talking about diencephalon, and then a little bit by the end of the lecture I'll talk to you about the cerebellum. From the uh, diencephalon, uh, I'll first talk about the overview of anatomy, and then go into deeper about the nuclei and the tracts. All right, so. Speaking of the diencephalon, what is diencephalon? It's divided into four parts. Anatomy loves to divide things. So we're going to be talking about four parts. Epithalamus, thalamus, hypothalamus, and subthalamus. You can see over here in this picture in Ken Hub that uh, the green part is the entire diencephalon highlighted for you. So we will talk uh, more about it now. So. This is a more detailed picture, just to have an idea of where we are in the brain. You can see the telencephalon around, you can see the diencephalon in brown, you can see that under the diencephalon we have the brainstem, and right behind the brainstem there is the cerebellum. So as you can see from the overview, as exactly where the diencephalon is located, you can see that the diencephalon is mostly covered by the telencephalon. So if I take my brain, if, I, if, if you can imagine that you're holding a brain in dissection and um, you look at it from the anterior view, so if you look at it from this view, you can see that you can see a little part of the diencephalon. So that will be my ventral view. And then if I look at the back, you can see that you can barely see anything. You can, maybe you can see this tiny bit of uh, view of the diencephalon, but mostly you won't be able to see anything. That's my, uh, my dorsal view. Um, other than the views that we're going to have, uh, the diencephalon we said that was divided into epithalamus, thalamus, hypo, and sub. So you can see over here that if I delineate the epithalamus, it's this pineal body. It's a very tiny structure over here uh, at the back of my diencephalon. Um, that's and then we also have the other part of the diencephalon called the thalamus. You can see that over here, this X-shaped structure, there are two of, two of them. Uh, under the thalamus, that's why it's called hypo, because hypo means under, you can see that this entire thing is my hypothalamus. And there is sub, so another word for under, but in this case, the subthalamus will be somewhere over here, very close to the midbrain. Uh, you can see that it says that rostral extension of the midbrain. So this over here, if I would have a cross section, I would be able to see my substantia nigra and my red nucleus. So if you go back to your first schemas and cross sections of your, uh, of your in your white book, and you go through the midbrain, the uh, rostral cross section of my midbrain, you'll be able to see a big black nucleus, the substantia nigra, and the big red nucleus called the red nucleus. All right, so we already spoke about this and we said that the diencephalon is completely surrounded by the cerebral hemispheres. Together, the diencephalon and the telencephalon makes the cerebrum. And we again spoke about the fact that the diencephalon is right under over here uh, is the brainstem consisting of the midbrain pons and medulla oblongata and right behind it is the cerebellum. All right, so um, now we're going to talk about the diencephalon in according to the views, because if I look at my face, obviously my nose is in the front, my hair is at the back. So every time we talk about any structure in anatomy, especially in the brain, because it's so compact with so many different structures, you, have, you always have to mention which view are you talking about. Because this, for example, is a sagittal view. I will not be able to see a lot of things that is in sagittal view that will be found in ventral view, for example. So you always, always, always in the oral exam, whenever you start talk about the gross anatomy, you have to start with 
which view are you talking about? So you can see that I have the different cross sections of my brain here and different views. This, this is for you to familiarize yourself with the idea that um, my frontal cross section will be a cross section through my head. My sagittal cross section will be a cross section going midline and you're going to see the inside of my brain over here, the sagittal view. And uh, you can see how different the, these two structures are. So whenever I talk about the frontal cross section, bear in mind which type of cross section I'm talking about. And sagittal is midline, so you'll be talking about different sections of the brain. You can see over here in this picture um, the um, the brainstem, and you can see that this is basically the anterior view. This is slightly the lateral, and somewhere over there will be the back of my brainstem. So again, just to bear in mind, please uh, bear in mind that um, different views, different um, sections of the brain will show completely different things. And you should be able to, every time you look at the structure, try to be able to look at them in different cross sections and views so that you can really have a good idea of where exactly everything is located. So, um, like I said, uh, that I told you that the diencephalon is located right above my brainstem. So when I show you this picture and I tell you the ventral view of the diencephalon, it makes sense for me to be able to see this my brainstem over here, right here. I can see my pons, I can see my medulla oblongata, and I can see my cere uh, midbrain with the cerebral peduncles. So these are my cerebral peduncles. What is a cerebral peduncle? As you can see over here, the cerebral peduncles would be somewhere over here located, but not exact because this is a different cross-section like we spoke about it a minute ago. The cerebral peduncle is just a structure that holds my brainstem to my cerebrum. That's why it's called cerebral peduncle. So over here you can see that these are my cerebral peduncles. And um, you can see the brainstem. Uh, different parts, my pons and my medulla oblongata. And in the between my cerebral peduncles, you can see the small structures over here that will be we will be talking about shortly. Uh, so uh, this is the ventral view and I didn't need to remove my telencephalon to be able to see these things. You can see that the telencephalon is not removed to be able to see this view. Now, in this picture over here, I removed the telencephalon for you to be able to see it better. Um, uh, for you to be able to see it better. You can see that, again, I have my brainstem, my cerebral peduncles, my pons, my medulla oblongata. What else can I see in the ventral view of my diencephalon? You can see, uh, just like over here, you see this uh, tract right and similarly over here in purple you can see this optic tract this optic tract um, continues to join over here uh, uh, so like I said the optic tract on each side here and here and then it joins at the chiasm to become the optic nerve which will supply and innervate the eye so you can see the visual stimuli so the ventral view of my diencephalon will contain this optic tract with my optic chiasm. You can again see my cerebral peduncles, which I already spoke about. I said that the cerebral peduncle holds my brainstem to my cerebrum. That's why it's cerebral peduncle. And you can see over here we have the mammillary body. It's a, it's a, uh, it's, sorry, over here, my mammillary bodies, there are two hillocks, basically two bumps that are over here. And you can see up right above my these two bumps or two hillocks above my mammary body, I have the hypophy hypophysis, my infundibular stem, which will continue into my pituitary body. So my infundibular stem, which is basically like, imagine like a, a, like a, like a, like a flower. A flower needs to have a stem, and then the flowers themselves. So the stem is the root of the flower, so it needs to have a stem that will continue as a process and then continue into the pituitary body which we'll talk about more um, show, um, soon. Actually, let me just show it to you here. You can see that over here, this is again, sagittal cross-section. And you can see you have the stem, the process, and the posterior pituitary over here. So again, 
but this is the ventral view of the diencephalon. So you can see that the same structure here and here, you can again see the process, the stem, and the pituitary is cut off. Uh, looks com slightly different from, well, some can say completely, but some might say slightly, from this structure over here. So always, always, always compare different views, especially if some of you have dissection 2 left, because of course, uh, they'll, they'll, you can see that if you never compare them, this and this, it will look completely different for you in dissection exam. All right, so that's um, it for the ventral view. You can see there's not much you can talk about in the ventral view. Everything else is covered. So we have to basically imagine that I have my brain stem and my brain and I'm flipping it over now. And I'm gonna show you the dorsal view. This is the back view of my brain, my diencephalon. Um, again, to give you an idea of what I'm talking about in 3D dimensions, at first I was talking about the ventral view, which is over here. So imagine looking from this direction, and now I'll talk about the dorsal view, which is basically from this direction. Alright, so, dorsal view. Um, the dorsal view uh, of the diencephalon contains the first thing you notice is this massive X-shaped structure, which is called mythalamus. Mythalamus, as you probably already know, consists of many um, nuclei, but the nucleus, particularly at the back, is called the pulmonary nucleus. And that pulmonary nucleus makes this bump. You can see that over here you have this bump of my, on my thalamus, and that's called the pulmonary thalamus. Why? Because the bump is made by the pulmonary nucleus, so it's called pulmonary thalamus. You can see that this entire thing is my thalamus, but right on top of it there is another more like an egg, not more like a C-shaped, egg-shaped structure that's on top of my thalamus. It's called the caudate nucleus. This entire thing is my caudate nucleus. And like I said, in anatomy we always want to divide things and have specific borders. So as an anatomist, I need to know where exactly does my caudate end because you can see that they're fused together. And where does my thalamus start? So that line between my caudate, that border between my caudate and my thalamus is called my sulcus terminalis. Sulcus, like a shallow groove, terminalis meaning end. So like the, the groove that, that terminates the border between the caudate and the thalamus. So it's this, it's this line over here. Uh, all right, in this uh, sulcus terminalis, I have a picture over here. So this is exactly what we spoke about again, but this is a, a schema. I, I, I prefer always drawing pictures to my students because it's just so much easier to explain it when I can draw. So um, I hope this makes you smile because anatomy is cool, right? <laughs> Anyway, so we have the caudate over here, and we have the thalamus. Exactly what we spoke about here, right? Caudate here, and thalamus here. And we spoke about this line that separates my caudate from my thalamus. So it's this black line that I drew in the schema, between my caudate and my thalamus. But you can see I drew another wiggly line on top of my black straight line, right? So that should... Um, that should uh, basically give you a vi like a visual scheme for you to understand that on top of my sulcus or sulcus terminalis or you can just imagine it as a line right the, the terminal line in which there is a vein it's a tiny tiny vein called the thalamostroid vein and the thing is that these structures in the diencephalon are super super tiny you will probably not be able to even like uh, um, uh, pointed out in dissection exam because it's super duper tiny and um, That's why I had to draw it so you're gonna have to use your imagination and my schema to really imagine that there There is supposed to be like a vein on this line and this line this vein is called thalamostriate vein For those of you that find this word super hard divide it always divide words in anatomy You can see that there is a thalamo meaning 
thalamus because there's a thalamus here and stria because it's a line sulcus stria so the line thalamus so the vein that's on the line that's next to the thalamus so it, it makes sense right when you divide the word into two bits so there is a thalamus stria vein on top of my sulcus terminalis right uh, close to my sulcus terminalis, there is a small strip of fiber called stria terminalis. Again, uh, just imagine, use your imagination, you make a schema where you do that because here in Sabota, it only shows the stria terminalis, it doesn't really point out the sulcus terminalis, so I can't really use the book to show it to you, but just imagine another line next to my sulcus terminalis. And, um, yeah, okay, so moving on, we, again, just to recap, because I spoke a lot, we had the caudate over here, the thalamus over here, we had the line that separates these two called sulcus terminalis, on top of this line there is a vein called the thalamus straight vein. Alright, now, there is another really important line or structure that you need to know. It's called tenia choroidea. Um, tenia choroidea. So, if you know what the choroid plexus is, the choroid plexus is just a bunch of cells that make my CSF. All right. This is a um, super like blood vessels kind of um, structure, and if you like kind of pick on it and you peel it, it's uh, it's gonna leave a line. And this line is called tenia choroidea. And I've drawn this line for you in dots on this thalamus. So if, if I, uh, so this is where my choroid plexus was located, all right? After I removed the choroid plexus. So imagine I pluck the choroid plexus out and there's a line left and that's called the tenia choroidea. Now, why are these two borders super important? Because between my tenia choroidea and my thalamus straight vein, on top of my sulcus terminalis, there is a space that I've drawn in yellow, and that space is called lamina affixa. It's not space, it's basically um, a layer of ependymal uh, cells. You do not need to know what ependymal cells are, that's histology, but you just need to know that in between these two lines there is lamina affixa, which consists of a specific type of cells. That's all you need to know. All right, so enough with the detailed anatomy of the specific lines and layers. We can move on to something more uh, seeable, if that's a word. Um, you can see that over here, we have this structure over here, one and two. It's, uh, it's an enlargement. You can call it an enlargement on both sides of the thalamus. It's called trigonum habenulare. Why is it called trigonum? Because it looks like a triangle. Trigonum habenulare. The trigonum habenulare, there are two of them. They connect, and that connection is called habenular commissure. Commissure for communication. So, habenular commissure. And uh, from that habenular commissure, we have a bump. Not a bump, but a pineal body. For, yeah, so this, this bump or this better to say pineal body is uh my is part of my epithalamus remember we spoke about it so my epithalamus is this part this this these tiny guys over here makes up my epithalamus all right so moving on what else do we can we really see in the dorsal view of my diencephalon i spoke about this is another picture but same thing i spoke about we have the thalamus here, we have the caudate here, so the thalamus, caudate, and we spoke about the sulcus terminalis. Oh, there you go, you can see the actual vein, the thalamus straight vein. This blue thing is my thalamus straight vein, which I did it with the wiggly schema over here. And you can see that there is this yellow line, lamina affixa. This yellow part is my lamina affixa. So, just for you guys to have an idea, and uh, again, thalamus, right, with my pulvinar thalami, the bumps, my pineal body, my habenular trigon, my habenular commissure. Now, moving further into the brain, you can see that between my thalami, which are two X-shaped structures, 
which are one over here and one over here. There is an actual space. So my tabinular tribe, my thalamus, is the F-shaped structure. So imagine my fist and my thalami, and uh, which are over here. And there is a space. This the space in between, which I circled in purple, is where my third ventricle is located. The third ventricle is, for now, you just need to know that it's a space where my CSF is located. That's all you need to know for now. But in between, in that space, there is a small point where the two thalami touch each other. And uh, that is called the interthalamic adhesion. Adhesion meaning connection. Right? So, I think we are done with the um, dorsal view of the diencephalon. We can move on to the medial view. Alright? So, what can we find in the medial view of my diencephalon? The most important structure, well not the most important, but one very important structure that delineates or uh, separates my thalamus from my hypothalamus is this tiny line called my hypothalamic sulcus. Over here, I see it better. You can see this hypothalamic sulcus. Again, this is my medial view, which means I, I cut my brain in half, and I'm showing you this part of my brain. Again, you can see the brain stem, the cerebellum. Uh, I'm not going to talk about what this is, but it's part of the tenencephalon because it's going to confuse you. And uh, you can see that, okay, so we have the thalamus here, the sulcus term hypothalamic key, and the hypothalamus. Why is this line important? Because it separates my thalamus from my hypothalamus. What else can I see on my media view? On my media view, again, you can see um, my, uh, okay, you cannot really see the third ventricle because third ventricle is actually a space. So over here, if I, I, if I added my other side of my brain and I put it together, there would have been like a space. So this this entire place would have been like a tiny space called the third ventricle. Okay, so we know that the thalamus and the hypothalamus makes the border for the third ventricle, the lateral border of the third ventricle. You can also see this point over here, this tiny guy here. This is the space where the thalamus touch each other the interthalamic adhesion, which in this view, in the dorsal view, it looks like something like this. Again, compare your views, connect them, so that you have a good 3D imagination of what you're memorizing. Alright, in this view, in the medium view, you can also see the mammary body, you can also see the hypothesis, and you can also see the optic tract. Right? which all of them makes the floor of my third ventricle because like i said the third ventricle is this space over here so the lateral border of my third ventricle is my thalamus and the hypothalamus but the floor is this 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 space over here all right so now let's uh i to recap as to what i spoke about because i know it's a lot of information all at the same time um, I spoke about the overview anatomy of my diencephalon, and I said that we have the epithalamus, which we spoke about, and we said it consists of the pineal body and my habenular trigon. Then we have the thalamus, this egg-shaped structure, the hypothalamus, which is divided by my sulcus hypothalamicus, and the subthalamus, these, these two nuclei that are close to my midbrain. So now I can go further into detail about my thalamic nuclei. If you go back, I want to I want you to see where the thalamus is located. You can see that the thalamus is literally in the middle of my brain. My brain, what's a function of my brain? It transmits signals, right? It sends and receives signals. If it sends, it's called efferent, E for exit. If it receives, it's an afferent signal. My brain constantly either receives or sends signals for it to work, for me to be functioning. My thalamus is right in the middle, meaning that my thalamus is like a relay station. It's like it bounces signals in and out. 
in and out. Everything that enters my brain, obviously it's gonna go through my spinal cord, through my brainstem, then the thalamus, and then the cortex, and vice versa. When I wanna make an action, when I wanna move my hand, my motor cortex will send a signal to my thalamus, thalamus through my brainstem, spinal cord, motor, uh, brachial plexus. So everything that's happening has to go through the thalamus first, which is why it's called the final relay station. Everything I spoke about is visually represented in this picture over here. It's not the best, I couldn't find anything better, to be very honest. So you can see that we have the thalamic nuclei, you can see the cerebral cortex over here, and you can see these fibers going in and out of the thalamus um, for various functions. Various functions, what are they? Touch, temperature, pain, conscious awareness, and etc. The main thing you have to know uh, for anatomy is that it, all the ascending pathways terminate before being transmitted to the cerebral cortex. So, all the fibers that are going to go to the cortex, which is over here, is going to have to pass through this thalamus. So, the keyword is the relay station, the final relay station. That's the word they want to hear if they ask you what's the function of the thalamus. Relay. Alright, so before we talk about the function of the thalamus, first we need to anatomically divide the thalamic nuclei. Everything in, uh, in my body is first divided anatomically, then functionally, because, and a lot of times they're connected. So, first we always want to talk about the anatomical division, then we're going to talk about the functional division, meaning what it does. Okay, so the division of the thalamic nuclei. Um, the thalamus, you can see, like I spoke, uh, you can see this is my horizontal cross section. So we spoke about sagittal cross section, frontal cross section, and this is my horizontal cross section. You can see over here, this is my horizontal cross section in my brain. You can see my cortex over here, my white matter, and you can see my thalamus, my X shaped nuclear uh, structure with, with a bunch of nuclei. And um, this uh, X-shaped structure is actually divided. So you can see this massive X-shaped structure, and you can see that it's divided into medial part, lateral part, and anterior part. It's divided by a, uh, by a structure called internal medullary lamina. What is my internal medullary lamina? Internal medullary lamina is the white matter. Every time you talk about something in the neuroanatomy, you have to specify, is it a nucleus or a white matter? For some of you, it's very obvious, and for some of you, it might not be, so I'm just um, making sure you all are on the same track. So, we have this white matter, you can see over here, if you want to the best picture, oh, this is bigger, yeah. So, you can see my column is here, you can see my white structure over here, my internal medullary lamina. That separates my thalamus into anterior, medial, and lateral groups, nuclear groups. So we divided these nuclear groups into anatomically into these three. Now, uh, let's talk about the parts. So, we know that the anterior nuclear group consists of the anterior nuclei. Simple, easy, done. But you can see that you should also mention that it's the internal medullary lamina bifurcates. It bifurcates into over here. So it kind of borders my anterior um, nucleus at times. Furthermore, what's the medial group? The medial group consists of this, this guy over here. My goes to medial nucleus. That's it. That's all there is. Things get a bit tricky on the lateral side. On the lateral side, we subdivide my lateral nuclear group into ventral and dorsal. So ventral is over here and dorsal is a bit slightly up. Dorsal kind of means uh, above. So that's why it's over here that this is my dorsal group. Alright, let's talk about the ventral uh, row first. Starting from the back, you can see that over here I have my medial and lateral genital bodies. These are extremely important anatomically and functionally, so you have to know them in the final exam. You cannot not know, not know these. If you get lazy and if you forget something else or it just skips your brain, that's, well, 
I don't know about that. It, it could have been forgotten, but these are not forgivable. You have to know them. You have to know their function. All right, so we got the medial geniculate body. It's responsible for hearing and lateral geniculate body, responsible for light vision. So the good mnemonic that um, uh, you can use is medial for M, M for music, and lateral L for light. So you can kind of use that mnemonic to remember the function of these nuclei. Furthermore, there's more nuclei rostrally, so anterior, because rost rostral means nose. So in the brain, because it's located in this weird way, let's say, uh, when I say anterior, it doesn't really make sense. So it's better, in the brain, it's better to always use the word rostral. So rostral, aka anterior, we have the ventral anterior, ventral lateral, and ventral posterior nuclei. So these are my all my lateral ventral um, nuclei. Genocleid bodies, ventral anterior, ventral lateral, ventral posterior nuclei. Again, the ventral posterior is subdivided into ventral posterior lateral, ventral posterior nuclei. All right, let's talk about the, uh, the dorsal view. We spoke about the ventral view, which is this guy over here. And now we're going to talk about the dorsal view, which is the guy on top. The lateral dorsal over here, there is the lateral posterior over here, and the colon. These are the nuclei that fix the lateral dorsal row of my thalamic nuclei. Over here at the bottom are the nuclei that mix the lateral ventral nuclei of times. Just to the last bit of my nuclei, um, we also have something called the particular nucleus over here, this great uh, nucleus over here. This particular nucleus, as you can see, it's not actually really kind of like a part of the thalamus. As you can see, it's kind of like separated from the thalamus. Um, you're going to have to use your imagination again here. Imagine that there is a, there is a lamina, or if you are not use the word lamina, it, it's basically kind of like a sheet of paper. Imagine like a sheet of paper that separates my thalamus, this part, from my nucleus reticularis thalamus. So, and that sheet of paper is called external medullary lamina. Okay, external medullary lamina. Again, it's white matter. My external medullary lamina is white matter. Remember, we had another white matter, which was over here, so my inside the thalamus, separating my thalamus into anterior, medial, and lateral groups. But that's because it's inside, it's, it's what it's called my internal medullary lamina. That was over here. So we have the internal medullary lamina within the thalamus, and we have the external medullary lamina outside the thalamus. Okay, so we have the nucleus reticularis, and the last nucleus we're going to talk about is this guy over here, central medial nucleus within my internal medullary lamina. Alright, okay, so now, we, everything we spoke about so far with the thalamus, these have the only anatomic divisions. They will not mean anything if I don't know their function, right? So now I need to talk about their functions. What are the functional classifications of my nuclei? Also remember that, like, uh, functional classifications are extremely important clinically. Because if I have a lesion in my brain, or some kind of a stroke, or some kind of a tumor, based on where it is anatomically, and based on which nucleus it's affecting functionally, my patient is going to have completely different symptoms. So you're going to have to understand that these anatomical and functional classifications are crucial for uh, future diagnosis of patient conditions. Alright, so... Anatomical position, we spoke about it, this anterior, medial, and lateral, and now actual function is specific, non-specific association. For the specific, we have sensory, somatosensory, and motor. First, we're going to talk about the um, specific relay nuclei. Specific meaning is going to do a specific, it's going to go to a specific part of my cortex to do a specific job. What is it? My specific relay nuclei 
like I said, we have sensory, somatosensory, sorry for the uh, typo, and motor. So we're going to talk about sensory and motor. First, we're going to talk about the sensory, guys. Remember, I told you about the lateral genicoid body over here. I spoke about it here for you, here and here, um, on the slide this year. I told you that this, this is extremely important, right? So let's talk about it, why is it important in terms of function. So the lateral genicoid body is uh, going to make an elevation on the posterior end of the thalamus, because of anatomy, and uh, the genicoid body, every bump on my brain is is made by a nucleus. So this bump, the lateral genicoid body, consists of the nucleus corporis genicularis uh, lateralis. This guy, nucleus corporis genicularis lateralis, uh, is going to receive input via my optic tract. So, where is my optic tract? Do you remember that we spoke about the vision? I said that the lateral genicoid body is important for vision. So how is it important? I also, I'll tell you that I also spoke about how um, in the CNS, everything is going to be transmitted up, down, afferent, efferent. So when I see something, that is going to have to pass through my optic nerve, then my bifurcate optic chiasm, go through my optic tract, reach my lateral genicoid body over here, which is what? Part of my thalamus. And my thalamus will relay that uh, information to my cortex, my visual, primary visual cortex. So it goes back to the keyword relay. It basically transmits the signal it received. So to recap, to put it in simpler words, my lateral genital body, which is a nucleus uh, that is part of my thalamus, is going to receive information, so afferent, from the optic nerve. Uh, or more precisely optic tract, because this is nerve, chiasm, and tract. So it's going to receive information from optic to rect, and then send that signal to my primary visual cortex, area 17, towards my area 17. So, always remember, afferent is optic tract, efferent is primary visual cortex. So because it receives something, and give it, gives it to someone else, it's the relay station, okay? <sighs> Alright, so, the next one. We spoke about the lateral genital body, and now we got a medial genital body, right? So, if you remember my gross anatomy, right? So, we spoke about this guy. Now we're going to talk about this guy. Functional classification. So, in the medial genital body, which we said, is a type of specific nucleus specific sensory nucleus of my thalamus. It's responsible for hearing. So, for it to be able to relay or send the signal to the cortex, right? If it's, uh, it's going to have to receive the signal from somewhere. And we're talking about hearing. So if we're talking about hearing, we're, gonna, we're talking about our ear. Ear is innervated by the cochlear nerve. So the cochlear nerve, which is innervates my uh, organ of corti, the organ of course is going to send the signal to my cochlear nerve, which is over here. It's going to receive the cochlear nucleus is going to receive that. Then we don't need to talk about this. This is my uh, crossing and trapezoid body. I think it's a bit of detail for you guys. Um, uh, for um, after my cochlear nucleus received the input, it's going to send it to my superior olivary nucleus. From my superior olive nucleus is going to go to my inferior colliculus, and from my inferior colliculus is going to go to my medial genital body, which we said is my specific sensory nucleus. It's my second type of specific uh, sensory nucleus of my thalamus. All right, so we were here. This is the guy is going to receive information from my cochlear nerve and send it to my auditory cortex. Easy, right? All right, so these are literally the most important uh, nuclei you're going to have to talk about uh, in the exam. After this, the ventral posterior, lateral and ventral posterior medial, there's not a lot of information. Just 
sensory, light touch, thermal, and somatosensory information. Um, so it's not a lot of information, but I would definitely recommend to know this pathway and this pathway very well because it's also going to be required for you to know this pathway in other questions such as the optic nerve. So he could um, he could easily ask you about the pathway in, in the cranial nerve questions as well. All right. So all right. So we're done with the sensory. Um, there is not much I can talk about anymore. We can move to the motor um, nuclei of the thalamus. Again, you can see in the schema over here from the white book, uh, we spoke about the sensory nuclei over here. And now we're going to move on to the motor nuclei, which are in red. They are also, again, in the ventral row, because we haven't reached the dorsal row yet. So, we're talking about motor. Motor, um, I think, I'm not really sure if you have studied uh, the basal ganglia yet, but if you know that basal ganglia and cerebellum and the primary motor cortex, these three guys are the most important guys or structures that um, are responsible for movement. So obviously, if it's relaying information, it's going to relay, to the information, relay that information to the part of the brain that's responsible for movement. So um, it makes it that much easier. So we spoke about ventral anterior nucleus, which is this guy over here. Uh, I don't know if I have a picture. So you guys are going to have to, again, use your imagination. Um, it, um, so the globus pallidus and prefrontal cortex it's going to be somewhere on this side of my if you can imagine that my thalamus is here and my okay let me use the pictures so uh we are over here thalamic nuclei are over here and we're talking about ventral anterior nucleus which will be somewhere over here and this ventral anterior nucleus is responsible for motor so what is it going to do it's going to receive information and then send it to my prefrontal cortex over here. Makes sense, right? If it's anterior, it's going to go to the prefrontal cortex, right? And it's also going to send a signal to globus pallidus, which is going to be a central nucleus somewhere over here in the brain, which is part of the basal ganglia and responsible for movement. So, uh, yeah. So the ventral post anterior nucleus is going to receive the information from the basal ganglia and then project it to the prefrontal cortex. So relay again. Ventral lateral nucleus is going to um, feedback circuit. So these why is there a circuit in the motor? So you need to understand that with sensory it was super easy. You receive the information, you send it to the cortex. Done. With motor it's a bit different because you have to also know that with motor, we don't want unnecessary movement, jerky movements of my body, right? How do I make sure that I don't do any weird movements that I don't want to be doing whilst I'm teaching this lecture? Every signal that is sent by my globus pallidus first, or my, my prefrontal cortex, any movement that I want to initiate, okay, needs to first go to my thalamus. My thalamus needs to decide, is this movement necessary? And then it sends that signal back to my uh, to where it came from, to my cortex, and says yes, it's necessary to make this hand gesture. So this hand gesture is made. Maybe this hand gesture is not required. So my thalamus is going to be like, no, stop. I don't need this. So that's why I need to have a feedback circuit. It needs to be a circuit in my motor system. There has to be a circuit. In my sensory, there is no requirement for for circuits. So we're going to talk about this more in the. Um, uh, in basal ganglia and all that stuff, so I'm not going to bore you guys too much with this information, but for you to really know what I mean by the circuit is just this, all right? My cerebrum is going to send my information to thalamus, for example, and uh, it's going to go back to my cerebellum, for example, so it really depends. But really, this is actually not that hard to memorize because you can see that cerebrum, primary motor cortex, cerebellum, basal ganglia. Three most important things that are required for movement. Obviously, they're going to be connected by the thalamus.
right? Because we're talking about motor nuclei. All right, so we're done with uh, specific nuclei. Now we're going to move on to non-specific, and then we're going to talk about association. Non-specific nuclei. Um, non-specific nuclei. We have two of them. Intralaminar, which was over here, this guy, and uh, reticular, which we spoke about over here, right? So intralaminar and reticular, which is next to the external lamina, right? Middle lamina. All right. So what's the function of my intralaminar nuclei? Here is where they're going to talk about reticular formation. So um, I decided to put the picture of the reticular formation for you guys so you know what I'm talking about when I'm we'll be explaining the function of this nucleus. What is reticular formation? You can see that uh, it's just like a bunch of gray and white matter dispersed throughout the brainstem. It's divided into two groups. I'm not going to talk about reticular formation but as more than that. You just need to know for now that reticular formation is a mix of white and gray matter in three groups in the brainstem throughout. You can see it's in the midbrain, in the pons, and the medulla. So in every cross section, you're going to find a particular formation. So now we know what it is. Now this intralaminar nuclei it, uh, is going to receive afferent information from the particular formation. Makes sense, right? Because the thalamus will be somewhere on top, so it's going to have afferent from the reticular formation going into the thalamus. And then efferent, so exiting the thalamus, is going to project to the neostriatum, so nucleus caudatus and putamen. Um, why? You need to know this intralaminar nucleus um, is extremely important. Why? Because um, my reticular formation's function is consciousness and alertness, right? One of the functions. It's going to make that happen through my intralaminar nucleus. So, to put it in a very, very, very simple words, whenever I go to sleep, my reticular formation sends a signal to my thalamus. My thalamus does not relay that information to my cortex. So that's why I'm sleeping. Um, whereas when I'm awake, when I wake up, my, uh, my reticular formation is able to send those signals to my thalamus, to my intralaminar nuclei, and those intralaminar nuclei relay the information to my cortex. So, when my thal this thalamic nucleus decides to relay the information to the cortex, I'm awake, I'm alert. When my thalamus decides, no, that's enough, no more signals, I'm, I'm sleeping. So really, this nucleus is extremely important for the consciousness and, awake and wakefulness. Okay, so that's the main intralaminar nucleus. Oh, and here I also put an EEG, because in case you guys were wondering what an EEG is, it's just a, it's a machine that um, measures my electrical signals in my brain. All right, so that's it. Reticular nucleus. It's one of my non-specific nuclei, which is this guy over here, reticular nucleus. Um, even though it's called reticular nucleus, it has not, it's not involved in my reticular ascending system. This is my reticular formation, okay? It's not associated with that. My reticular nucleus is going to receive input from my cortex, thalamus, and corticothalamic tracts, and integrate. So we're just going to integrate the information between the brain structures. So not that important. I would say that the intralaminar nucleus with consciousness and, and alertness is pretty important. This is um, a visual representation of what I wanted to explain regarding this nucleus. So it's a detail. You do not need to be able to draw this in the exam. You uh, pretty sure uh, so yeah but the only reason why I drew this I put this from Sobota for you guys is so that some of you are visual learners like me so maybe you can use this to really understand what's going on um, okay so this is my non-specific thalamus here right this guy is this my so 
I told you that. Imagine my thumbs is somewhere over here. My reticular formation is here, right? So um, my reticular formation, which is my RS system, my sleep wake cycle from the reticular formation, is going to take signals, my visual, my uh, serotonergic systems, okay, meaning if I'm going to sleep, uh, right? Um, will I be able to fall asleep if the, the lights are on and someone's talking and someone's someone's screaming and the the, um, the brightness of the room is super high? No, probably not, right? Because there will be signal going here and here and there, so I'm alert. Um, whereas, um, imagine if this signal, my visual stimuli, everything's dark, there's a lot of serotonin going in my brain because it's really dark and uh, it's nighttime. There's no signal going by air to this, to this guy. So now I'm going to be sleeping, right? So there will be no alertness. Um, I don't know if I was able to explain this uh, simple, simply, and uh, but uh, I hope you guys really understand this because it's really nice to know what you're memorizing sometimes <laughs> with Nero. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. Again, detail, you don't need to be able to draw this. This is just for you to understand. Alright, so we can move to the third functional group of nuclei, which is my association nuclei. Association nuclei are going to transmit, connect to my association part of my areas of my cerebral cortex. Those are my medial nuclei, medial group, which is my dorsal medial nucleus. My uh, lateral dorsal group, these guys, one, two, three, and my anterior nucleus. What is it, what's happening here? Um, not that much you need to know, so it's very, like, short information so the dorsal medial nucleus over here uh, it's going to receive inf input from the limbic system and uh, send the signal to the prefrontal cortex not I, I, I would say that if you what you have to know from the older nuclei and their functions will be the medial lateral genicoid bodies a little bit about ventral anterior ventrolateral, just to know that they connect the cerebrum and cerebellum and basal ganglia. That's it. These two that they transmit somatosensory and sensory information. And that these, this guy and this guy is for uh, non-specific and that it's, that it's responsible for alertness and arousal. That's it. Not the way I'm explaining to you. The way I'm explaining it to you is just for you to really understand why why is this that that's it okay um, you you're not gonna have to explain in such detail uh, so dorsal medial receives input from the olfactory system and sends it to the prefrontal not that important functionally the dorsal nuclei lateral dorsal lateral posterior pulmonar pulmonar remember if you guys remember what structure does it make on the dorsal surface of my thalamus. I'm going to give you guys a moment to think and then I will show you. So the pulmonar nucleus, if you remember from my gross anatomy of my brainstem, uh, sorry, my encephalon, it's going to make my pulmonar thalamus. Remember the bumps in my thalamus. I do not want to go back, so you guys are going to have to like check it out by yourself. So. That's my pulmonar. And then we have the lateral dorsal and lateral posterior nuclei over here. Um, all three, one, two, three of these are, like I said, the lateral dorsal group. And all three, again, have connections to the occipital, parietal, temporal lobes. Not loves, lobes, sorry. Again, function unknown. So if you forget to, to mention these functions, not the end of the world, I would say, but really please make sure you know the lateral, medial, genital bodies, the entire pathway. Okay. Okay, so then we have the anterior group over here. It connects to my mammary body and its function is memory. Okay, so not that much 
detail in this. Okay, so I think we can move to the hypothalamus now. Um, okay, so where are we? We spoke about the thalamus. We spoke about the nuclei, we spoke about uh, the anatomic one and um, the functional classification. We spoke about the epithalamus, the pineal body, this tiny structure over here, and the hypothalamus triangle. Then now we're going to go to the hypothalamus, which is uh, divided from the thalamus by the sulcus. Remember, the sulcus is extremely important. Make sure you remember it. Okay, so where are we? We are in the hypothalamus. This, all of this over here. And we spoke about the hypothalamic sulcus. Yeah? Cool. So what's the function of the hypothalamus? Two main keywords you have to say in the exam. Homeostasis. It, it uh, regulates my constant internal environment. Number two, autonomic nervous system. It controls my ANS. Extremely important. This you have to say in the exam. What's the function, okay? What else? Surround the third ventricle. This we spoke about it. We said that we have the thalamus, the two X-shaped structures held by the interthalamic adhesion, the hypothalamus under it, and that in between them there is a space, and that space is occupied by my CSF, and that's basically my third ventricle. And uh, ventral to hypothalamic sulcus, that makes sense, right? This is the sulcus, the ventral. And uh, again, it's subdivided into anterior, over here, so this, this part, middle, and posterior hypothalamus. So, this is extremely crucial uh, for you to understand. Um, I wasn't able to find any of the, this cross section, the frontal cross section of the brain for some reason in, the, in any of the atlases. So, uh, just bear with my horribly uh, colored schema of from the white book, okay? So make sure you always check out the white book. Again, for your orientation, where are we? I said that we are in the frontal cross-section, right? This was my medial or sagittal cross-section, medial view, sagittal cross-section. So medial view is this way. This, this cross-section is this way, all right? So you can see my thalamus again. You can see my caudate on top, right? We spoke about it. I don't know if I'll be able to find it now, but let's go back a little bit. So we, yeah, again, gross anatomy. Thalamus here, caudate on top, okay? So let's go back. Thalamus uh, here, cut it on top, uh, and you can see that the space between the thalamus is my third ventricle. There you go. Um, it would have been more precise if I drew a black line to connect these two thalami. For what? Well, if you remember, what is the connection called between my um, two thalami? If you remember. It's called the interthalamic adhesion. Exactly. So, if I drew a black line over here, it would have been an interthalamic adhesion. And if you remember, I spoke about that sulcus that separates my caudate from my thalamus. Um, if you remember what that sulcus is called, uh, it was called the sulcus terminalis, right? And there's a vein on top of the sulcus terminalis. It's called the thalamostrate uh, vein. Exactly. Okay, so again, uh, for your orientation of the schema, I told you that there's a thalamus, caudate on top, hypothalamus under. Again, what's the line called between my thalamus and hypothalamus? Hypothalamic sulcus, right? Okay, so. Um, you can see that it's a very good schema to visually represent the borders of my third ventricle. The borders of my third ventricle, the lateral borders are my caudate, 
that thalamus and the hypothalamus, okay? That's why uh, you have this information written here, that the hypothalamus makes the border of the third ventricle. Okay, why did I talk about this? Because if I look at my sagittal cross section, I can divide my hypothalamus into anterior, middle, and posterior group. But if I look at this cross section, I can further divide my hypothalamus into this tiny part, periventricular zone, this tiny part, medial zone, and lateral zone. So depending on which cross section, we have two different classifications of my nuclei. Um, just to put everything into one again, into perspective, um, we said that if I have this view, then I can divide my hypothalamic nuclei into anterior, middle, and posterior nuclei. Anterior, middle, and posterior nuclei. If I look at this view, the frontal cross section, I'm going to have the third ventricle here, third ventricle, and then my hypothalamus here, right? So, which makes the border of my third ventricle. And the hypothalamus is then divided into periventricular. Peri means around. Ventricular meaning third ventricle, and then the medial row and the lateral row. So three rows, which will be one, two, three. Now we're going to have to talk about each groups of nuclei and their function. My anterior group is going to be divided into. So I'm going to talk about the anterior group, and these anterior group nuclei are periventricular row and the medial row. So periventricular meaning the one more medial to the ventricle and medial, medial meaning medial, I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, periventricular meaning this row over here and the medial row is this guy over here, okay? So the anterior group nuclei are divided into this row and this row. So just, again, use your imagination. <laughs> All right, so periventricular row. We said that the closest to the ventricle is called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Makes sense why we got the optochiasm here. Uh, I wonder if I have a better picture. Uh, here, I think. Mm. Yeah, well, you're going to have to just believe me that this is the optochiasm, okay? And since it's literally above the optochiasm, it's going to be called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And again, if it's close to my optic chiasm, it means that it has something to do with my light. What? Since it's close to my optic chiasm, my optic chiasm, my retina, is going to send the signal to my superoptic nucleus. So if I see bright light, my retina is going to send that signal to my op superoptic nucleus. And my superoptic nucleus it's going to be like, okay, you got to wake up. It's it's nice and bright. So it's the uh, sleep wake cycle, which is called the circadian rhythm. Again, sorry for the typo, circadian with the Y. So that's my circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythm is basically, if it's bright, you're supposed to be up awake and wanting to work. And if it's dark, you're supposed to feel sleepy because of your melatonin release and want to go to sleep. I know it doesn't work for everyone, but that's how it's supposed to work. <laughs> so, my superoptic nucleus, uh, superchiasmatic nucleus, is very important physiologically speaking. So, again, in anatomy, they would want you to know this nucleus in particular. So, make sure you know it. And since it's right next to the optic chiasm, it basically gives you the gives it away what the function is anyway. Next one, the medial row. We got the preoptic nucleus. Not nothing's nothing extraordinary about it. But these two guys, these two nuclei, again, I put a star for you over here. Very important to know their function. Okay, what's the function? Superoptic and paraventricular makes the it contributes to the hypothalamus hypophysical tract. We're gonna talk about it in a second. In not in a second, but. Let's go to this guy. So you can see over here, 
my paraventricular and supraoptic nuclei. You can, you can see that it makes my hypothalamal hypophysial tract. Right? So important. This these two you gotta you have to know them. You have to know them for the final exam. This is even not as important as these two guys are. This one you're gonna have to know them for the exam. And then we're gonna we got the anterior nucleus, alright? It's not nothing specific, nothing extraordinary function, so I didn't mention the functions. But again, please remember these two for the final exam. Alright, the other groups, we got the middle and the posterior group. Not much going on, so not much to memorize, except that we're going to have to know that the middle group, consisting of these nuclei, the arcuate, is important because it makes another, it, it's part of another important system called the hypophysial portal system, which we will also talk about here. Okay? So you're going to have to know that this nucleus is part of this uh, system. The other nuclei, if, if if you forget their function, it's okay, but the ones that are part of the hypothalamus hypophysial tract, this guy, and the ones that are part of the hypophysial portal system, extremely important, okay? You cannot forget those, the function of those. Um, and you got the ventromedial and there's new one there. Again, mm, the functions, I'm pretty sure it's not even listed in the white book, uh, but uh, yeah, so you don't need to not say much about it, just there. And the posterior group includes the posterior nucleus and the mammary nucleus. Mammary nucleus is important as well. Alright, so we spoke about the hypothalamus in general. We said that the hypothalamus separates from the thalamus over here by this line called the supus hypothalamic key. Um, the hypothalamus is going to continue down into something called the hypophysis. This entire thing is my hypophysis. It's a pea-sized organ, so it's super tiny, and it's located in my cella turcica of my sphenoid bone. Just imagine the bone here, and that little bony part of my sphenoid bone is called my cella turcica. Also important to know where it's located. My hypophysis is uh, subdivided into my adenohypophysis and my neurohypophysis. Um, my adenohyp- okay, notice how my adenohypophysis is, in this picture, pink, and the neurohypophysis is yellow, just like the rest of my brain. Yeah? Now, embryologically speaking, adenohypophysis is actually not ner nervous tissue. It comes from my ratkis pouch, from my tongue. You do not need to know all that. The reason why I'm explaining to you why uh, the reason why I'm explaining why adenohypophysis comes from it's not even a new nervous tissue will make sense in a second. Uh, so I just want you to know that right now adenohypophysis is actually not even nervous tissue. It's actually originally coming from your tongue or rat case patch. Okay. Then we got this uh, neurohypophysis, yeah? So the second part of my hypophysis. My neurohypophysis, you can see here, this is actual nervous tissue. You can see my nuclei over here. If you remember, um, we spoke about this. We spoke about my paraventricular and supraoptic nuclei. Uh, you can see that they're actually going down the axons of these nuclei. Now, when I say axons, if some of you forgot what it means, because this is histology and it's not anatomy, you can see when I say nucleus, just for some of you, because I know some of you have trouble understanding this, when I say nucleus, I mean this the neuron body, this part of it. This is the entire neuron, okay? This thing is the entire neuron. This guy over here is my uh, my uh, neuron body, cellular body. This over here, this long thing, is my axon. So when I was talking about FM fibers, FM fibers, these fibers that I'm talking about, that's the axon I'm talking about, okay? And when I say white matter, because my axon is myelinated, 
and myelin is made of fat and fat is white that's why my white matter is made up of enzymes and my gray matter is made up of neuron uh, bodies okay just uh, for you to remember that so what do you have to know about neurohypophysis? Um, like I said, um, the neurohypophysis is an actual part of my nervous tissue and adenohypophysis is not. And uh, the axons are going to pass through and make my stem, my infundibular stem. Remember, we spoke about this uh, stem in the beginning of the lecture in the um, gross anatomy of the diencephalon and I told you to remember the stem as like the root of the uh, of a flower that it's going to be a stem and then a process yeah so this is basically my stem in the process um, what else so what do you have to know about Neurohypophysis and adenohypophysis is completely different. Uh, when I okay, so let's talk about the hypothalamic tract. What is it exactly? It's basically a tract of my nuclei. Uh, it's a tract made up of my axons. Okay, keyword is axons. You have to say the word axons in the exam. So the axons, you can see this is my cell body. This is my axon. So cell body. Is equivalent of this, and so is this, and axon terminals are these butons, okay? My hypothalamic hypophysial tract is basically a tract made by my axons of my nucleus. So you can see that literally here. You can see that these axons make my, uh, you see it here as well, it makes my infundibular stem, okay? It makes my your hypophysis. Why is that important? You might think it's a detail, but it's not. It's not because it's ex you have to understand clinically it's extremely important. Why? Because this guy, where is okay, so I told you that the, the, the hypothalamus is uh, the function of hypothalamus is ANS regulation and homeostasis and endocrine function basically. The source of my hormone from my neurohypophysis, right? It comes, it comes out of here, right? It comes out of here, but it's not made here. Okay, so the hormones released from my neurohypophysis, it's released from there, but it's not actually made from there. This hormone is not made here. It's not made here. The hormone is made here. And here. So for you, you have to know that the hormones uh, are made in the nuclei of my hypothalamus, not in the neurohypophysis, all right? Which is completely, almost opposite to my adenohypophysis. Okay, now let's explain that. Okay. So, we spoke about the hypothalamus hypophysial tract. There is the, this guy is part of my neurohypophysis in the back, the real nervous tissue. This portal system is part of my adenohypophysis. Remember, I told you that my dental hypothesis is actually not real nervous tissue. Okay? It comes from Radke's pouch, tongue. What does that mean? You can see that in this picture of the schema, there's a neural hypothesis, that's the actual nervous tissue, and the dental hypothesis, and you can see this line that separates it. For my hypothesis to be able to communicate with my dental hypothesis, it's going to need a portal system, a venous system, to be able to communicate. It doesn't require that here. It just goes down because it's continuous nervous tissue. 
here it can't do that. It's gonna need vessels. It's gonna need like a transporter. So um, these nuclei are important. You have to know the portal system, which nuclei makes the, the portal system, right? You just know them preoptic, paraventricular, arcuate, tuberal. Uh, these are imp really important to know that these nuclei makes the head piece of the portal system. Notice that these nuclei, you have the axons. Notice where they end. They don't end here. In neurohypophysis, the nucleus starts here, axons end in the neurohypophysis. In adenohypophysis, the axon doesn't go all the way, it just goes all the way here. So, where does it end? You can see the superior hypophysal artery, right? Now, the superior hypophysal artery, you're going to have to know that it's a branch of internal carotid artery. Please don't forget. So the internal carotid artery gets a branch called superior hypophysal artery, and the superior hypophysal artery makes this plexus, vascular plexus, primary. Why primary? Because there's one more, so secondary. So you're going to have to know that these axons terminate not in the adenohypophysis, but they terminate in the eminentia medialis with the primary vascular plexus. Eminentia medialis is the structure over here. The primary vascular plexus is the actual plexus where these uh, enzymes terminate. So, once they terminate, here they make the hormone, went all the way down, all the way to your hypothesis, and store the hormone within these butons, okay? Terminal butons. So, these guys made the hormone oxytocin and ADH. Here, they're not going to make the hormone. They're going to either produce a releasing or inhibiting factor. So here, they're going to release the hormone uh, releasing or inhibiting factor, which will go to the eminentia uh, medialis, where the vascular plexus is located. And that is going to go down the portal system, portal vein, hypervisual portal vein, reach the secondary vascular plexus. Here, the releasing or inhibiting factor will tell my adenohypophysis, hey, we need more um, thyroid stimulating hormone. That's that, yeah? And we need more ACTH, for example. Uh, then I will be releasing hormone, sorry. You don't need to know hormone. I don't think you need to know hormones. Um, let me just check. the both Yeah. So, yeah. You're gonna have to, okay, so here the 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 releasing or the inhibiting factors that are produced by my um paraventricular arcuate preoptic tubular, they're gonna be released in my primary vascular plexus, it's gonna go down my portal vein, and here it's gonna tell my adenovisus, hey, make more of the hormone. Hey, stop making more of the hormone. So if it's releasing factor, it's going to tell my 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 adenohypophysis make more I don't know ACTH for example, LH, FSH, whatever. Or it's going to be inhibiting factors. It's going to be like, hey, stop releasing these hormones. This is where it goes back to the fact that I told you that the hypophysis function is endocrine and homeostasis, right? Endocrine because it regulates secretion of all these hormones. And homeostasis because these hormones are the guys that maintain my normal uh, internal environment. So the hypothalamus is an extremely important structure with very important functions, right? So I spoke a lot. I'm just gonna recap everything I said into basic two sentences. I said that the hypothalamus visual tract consists of the axons that's uh, that hold the hormones within these butons. Plain, simple, and direct, right? Whereas in the portal system, it's uh, gonna have releasing factor going to the adenohypophysis, and the adenohypophysis, the adenohypophysis itself will produce the hormone. So, key difference adenohypophysis actually makes the hormone that goes to the cavernous sinus internal jugular vein and the systemic circulation whereas the neurohypophysis 
does not make the hormone it releases. The, uh, the hormone is made in the nucleus. Alright, so the last I think we're gonna end up finishing slightly mm, faster uh, than expected. I was supposed to do the robots, I did not, but I promise to do it next time. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, so, um, cerebellum. Uh, again, I spoke about cerebellum a little bit when uh, we spoke about the motor nuclei. And I told you that, of course, if the motor nucleus function of motor nuclei of my thalamus, their function is motor, then it's going to relay the information to the cerebral cortex, because of the motor cortex there, to the basal ganglion, because its function is motion, and to the cerebellum, right? So cerebellum is my third super important structure in my brain that um, coordinates movement, okay? It coordinates movements, regulates muscle tone, maintains equilibrium. Equilibrium. So we're talking about vestibular nucleus, right? Vestibular nerve. Um, and muscle contraction at the right time. So every time we talk about movement, one of the structures we're going to always talk about is the cerebellum. So you can see over here we have the picture from Metters. So you can see that this is my brain. You can see my brain stem over here. Medulla oblongata, arms, midbrain. We spoke about the telencephalon. And uh, you can see my thalamus, my hypothalamus. And you can see, if you can see over here, I don't know if, how clear this picture is for you guys, but you can see the uh, pituitary gland and the neurohypophysis and the adenohypophysis and how it's located in this small pouch in that bone, sphenoid bone. Called the cella torsica, right? Uh, um, so you can see where the cerebellum is located. It's in the posterior cranial fossa and it's covered by part of my dura mater. The dura mater is called tentorium cerebelli, right? And this tentorium cerebelli separates my cerebellum from my occipital lobe. You can see occipital lobe here. And this blue line over here in my um, tentorium cerebellum. Let's talk about the gross anatomy. Um, it's divided into two hemispheres one, two, and it has a vermis in between. Alright, so the cerebellum further, if, again, always talk about the views because in the superior view you can see this in the mid sagittal view you can see this in sagittal view remember it's the cross uh if, if i just make a line through my face like this that's my sagittal view okay in the sagittal view i can see my anterior lobe my posterior lobe and my flocular nodular lobe Always within the brain, you have to talk about um, the borders. So if I'm talking about my anterior lobe, it ends in the primary fissure. And then we've got the posterior lobe that goes from the primary fissure all the way to my posterior lateral fissure over here. And then we got this tiny flocculum margin lobe that is separated from my posterior lobe by the Posterior lateral fission. Yeah. And again, again, the views. This is my sagittal view. This is how it looks like on the sagittal view. If I'm looking at it from the posterior, posterior way, from this view, or, yeah. if I'm looking at it from the posterior view, the same fissures, the primary fissure, the posterior lateral fissure, this guy, and this guy. They look completely different, right? So just make sure you look at the same structure from different views so to really know the three different structures. Alright, so 
again, when we talk about the cerebellum, just like every other part of my brain, we're going to talk about the gray matter and the white matter. You can see over here, again, just for you guys to have an overview of where you are. We spoke about the pineal gland, the habenular triangle, commissure, habenular commissure. We spoke about the thalamus, the pulmonar thalami. Here, you can actually see the median and lateral genitalic bodies. You can see the rest of the brainstem here, right? That's under my diencephalon and my cerebellum over here. Notice that cerebellum is here and my brainstem is here. And that between my brainstem and cerebellum, you got what? Which ventricle is this? My third ventricle, right? Uh, sorry, fourth ventricle. Third ventricle is here. So we spoke about the fourth ventricle, and we said that the, the cerebellum kind of covers my fourth ventricle. So this part, you can see here, 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 the fourth ventricle. Um, the part that holds my, the roof of my uh, fourth ventricle, that um, is part of my cerebellum, is called fastigium. Okay, so somewhere here, my fastidium. So just make sure you know that. So I bellum, the cerebral fossa, right behind the brainstem, and um, uh, that it's the posterior border of my fourth ventricle. Okay, so looking at, so we have got the general overview. We know where we are, right? So we have the brainstem, diencephalon, and somewhere here would be the telencephalon, yeah? So we're here, cerebellum. When we talk about the gray matter, what's going on here? You can see that we got the gray matter and cortex, right? Got the gray cortex over here. Inside the white matter, in the medullary center, we got the four nuclei on the side, on the side and on the other side. So that, that's how they're going to move. Okay, so the white matter uh, that we got. Now, I want you to notice something. The white matter is not just this stuff over here on the inside, which we said, why is it called white matter? Because axons are myelinated, right? And why is gray matter gray? Because it's the, which part of my cell, my neuron? The body, right? Cool. So, uh, we got the white matter, and we said it's over here, the medullary center, but we also have this. Remember, white matter, we said it's axons. Axons can be our fibers. These fibers can be either afferent, coming in, or afferent, coming out. Exit, E for exit. So, my white matter is also these, these three peduncles, cerebellar peduncles. Remember, I spoke about cerebral peduncles in the beginning of the lecture, right? It's somewhere here. Cerebral peduncle is a white matter that holds the brainstem to the cerebrum. Cerebellar peduncles is the white matter that holds the brainstem to the cerebellum. So don't confuse those two. Alright, so again, since it's white matter, it's often different fibers passing through here to go where? To the brainstem. Obviously, because the brainstem is right in front of it, right? Another thing that you should know is something called arbor vitae. If you look at the, this coily structure, this tree-like coily flowery structure that's made by the grain-white matter distribution, it's called the arbor vitae. That's it. So let's talk about the grain matter. We said there is a cortex and the four nuclei on each side, right? So these four nuclei are the stagial nucleus. This one, globose nucleus, this one, and doliform, this guy, and then they, this massive one. The medial collateral for the chimney's function here. Right, so. The cerebellum white matter. Um, like I said, that the cerebellum white matter is. Um, 
this time, superior, middle, and uh, inferior cerebellar peduncles. I said that there are afferent and efferent fibers passing through, right? You need to know a little bit about the what kind of fibers are passing through each peduncle. Now, it might seem super complicated, but it's actually not. We have the cerebellum here. The cerebellum peduncles will be somewhere here, right? Superior, middle, inferior. Just imagine them right now, okay? So, if I tell you, what kind of fibers do you think I'm going to pass to the superior cerebellum peduncle? Um, it's going to be all the nuclei, and that's all the nuclei of the cerebellum. But also, superior spinal cerebellum and river cerebellum tracts. Remember, nucleus river was part of what? Epithalamus, right? Sorry, subthalamus. And that subthalamus is going to be somewhere here. My superior cerebellar cerebella peduncle is somewhere here. So my imagine my uh, nucleus river here, passing a fiber through my superior cerebellar peduncle into my cerebellum. Well, it makes sense for it to be the superior cerebellar peduncle, because the river nucleus is on top. The other one, pontine, middle cerebellar peduncle. Notice that we said pons is here, midbrain is here, medulla oblongata is here. Pons and uh, cerebellum are on the same level, right? So it would make sense for the nuclei in the pons. Here, there are pontine nuclei. With pons, pontine nuclei. So the nuclei uh, from the pons are going to send fibers to the cerebellum. So it's going to be something like from here to here, through the middle cerebellum peduncle. It's going to be called ponto cerebellum. This is super easy, guys. You, 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 can, you can remember this by the time. Like, you know where the pons is, so it, it logically makes sense for it to be the pontus cerebellar tract going to the middle cerebral peduncle. And then we got the inferior cerebral peduncle. Now, not all of them kind of make sense, but some of them do. So at least if you can remember the ones that um, anatomically make sense. Um, you know that, for example, the the cellular nucleus, right? Cellular nucleus is somewhere here. It's going to have to go upwards, right? You're going to have to use the inferior cellular peduncle uh, to go to the cerebellum. It makes sense for it to be here. Um, then you got the spinal cerebellum. It's posterior spinal cerebellum. From the spine to the cerebellum. So again, it's going down up. It's going to make sense for it to cross the inferior cerebellum peduncle. And we also got the reticular cerebellar tract. Again, reticular formation is throughout the brainstem, right? So, not the best, but you can imagine that it, uh, the causal part of the reticular formation passes in the in inferior uh, cerebellar peduncle, so you can try and remember it that way, squeeze in that information. But, um, and the last one, cerebellar reticular reciprocal. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that was afferent, sorry, the uh, vestibular cerebellar, spinal cerebellar, and reticular cerebellar are afferent, meaning it's going to go into the cerebellum. And then there will be obviously tracks going from the cerebellum outside. Exit, afferent, so from the cerebellum to the vestibular, vestibule, obviously, because the vestibular nuclei are responsible for equilibrium. So depending on where my body is, my cerebellum is going to receive the information and send it to the vestibular nucleus, right? And we also have the cerebellar reticular tract. So from the cerebellum to the reticular formation. Um, I would recommend uh, knowing at least these three tracts for the final exam. Uh, the cerebellar vestibular, because I uh, posture and eye movement. So based on where my head is, my eye movement is going to change. You don't need to know that, but I'm just explaining it to you so that you understand what you're memorizing. In the exam, you just need to say this. Uh, spinal cerebellar tract, so from the spine to the cerebellum. Movement, obviously. So if my, if my, my, ha my hands are moving, information is going to go to my cerebellum and vice versa. 
and the point is your lower jaw. So movement and speech. Um, I think uh, I'm not really sure how much more detail they would require for the exam, but I would say that this would be the most important. There's the other classification. This is taken from Marek's lectures, Dr. Mark. So we can divide uh, the cortex and the cerebellar nuclei into another arrangement called the medial, paramedial, and lateral zone. So if it's a medial zone over here, it's going to be my prestigious nucleus with the cortex covering that vermis area. The paramedial zone is going to be the nuclei slightly more natural, so the involved from globally. That's over here. And we've got the lateral zone coming up over here. So that's going to be my lateral cortex with my nucleus dentatus, which will be obviously over here, right? Yeah. So this is, uh, again, stolen from Marek's lectures. And um, you can see that we got these three different zones and um, these different tracts that are coming in. So if it's coming in, is it afferent or afferent? It's afferent, right? So we're going to have all these different tracts uh, that are um, coming inward into my cerebellum. Okay, so we are done. Thank you for your attention. I know we finished slightly earlier. This is my first time, so bear with me. Maybe next time it will be better. Um, any feedback would be appreciated. I hope you guys found this useful. And I really do hope that I could make neuroanatomy slightly more interesting and more fun for you guys. All right? So I hope you guys have a great day and goodbye. Now I'm going to have to close this.